Chapter 2, Patterns of Nature. Memorable, repeatable, and found in our languages and cultures everywhere, patterns help us make sense of our world and ourselves. It is a collection of patterns that work together that form our ecosystems, our bodies, and our thoughts. We design in patterns to create beneficially interrelated systems. Patterning is good design. Patterning is clearly seen in nature, but what isn't readily seen is perfection. Euclidean geometric perfection is not found in nature. Nothing upon close examination is perfect. There is nothing perfectly flat, round, square, or straight in nature. We interpret nature with patterns, and all life replicates and thrives using patterns. If we recognize the patterns that exist, how they are used, when they are used, and where they are used, we can apply those patterns with relative assurance that they will behave predictably or naturally. Our natural systems and patterns shape the world around us, from changes in season, to the way snow melt travels down a slope, or to the way life reproduces. It's all pattern-based, consistent, and predictable. How to describe patterns. Patterns are useful for designers and educators, but are infinite in form, so they don't fit easily into Euclidean geometric thinking. The simple pattern groupings we cover here are generalized abstractions of pattern expression that allow us to identify them in nature and use them in design. Patterning is vital to creating planting guilds and scaling up any design. It is the application of a pattern. Pattern literacy is our ability to read patterns and their interrelations. We need to know both to be good designers. Patterns are formed when two or more media interact. There are endless patterns but here are some general ways of speaking about patterns. Shapes, their general outline. Branching, the dendritic focusing and spreading of water, veins, shattering glass, or roots. Pulsing, repetitious patterning, waves, the tides, winds, and heartbeats. Scattering, from wind or water, the drift and spread by pulsing stimuli like debris from a storm or clumps of trees in a windy region. Scattering. From wind or water, the drift and spread by pulsing stimuli like debris from a storm or clumps of tree in a windy region. Wave. Created by pulsing, creates a flow between two media like waves in water or sand. Streamlines. Created by forces over time like wind or water over rock, slowly shaping it with erosion, like a shoreline. Matrices. Patterns that interconnect in a repeating pattern that spreads like honeycomb cells, cracks like netting in mud, or snake scales. Cloud forms. An explosion shape like tree crowns, puppy clouds, or mushroom forms like a torus. Many patterns are found inside the torus. Spirals. Found in sunflowers, galaxies, and whirlpools. Lobes, rounded edges of reefs or lichens. The tree pattern. When two media interact, they often create a tree pattern. Atomic bombs, mushrooms, bones, erosion, deltas, communication networks, and trees themselves are examples. Often, the ends of these patterns are intensely intricate, dendritic, spherical, or spiral in expression. The chaos that occurs at the edge of this expression is usually where the most energy is manifesting. The fruit, the seed, the tender leaves, the initial intensity of an explosion, and the mushrooms are all example of the final expression of the tree pattern's behavior. Where the freshwater delta meets the saltwater edge, it is the most prolific even though it is the end of two different aquatic systems. Once we recognize a pattern, we can then begin to analyze its functions. Edge effect. Edge effect is pervasive. Once you begin seeing it, you can't stop. It's everywhere. It's in nature as much as it is in people's systems. The idea is simple. Where two different ecosystems meet, you will have a multiplier effect of species and interactions. The two sets of species combine with a third set, the species limited to the edge ecosystem, the edge species. These can be plants, animals, fungi, bacteria, or even people. We often think of successful people as having broad appeal. They can interact with multiple groups but are of none exclusively. They are edge species. Edges are also the most productive areas of nature. Estuaries, forest edges, along riversides, and coral reefs are all teeming with life greater than the two meeting ecosystems support independently. 
Increasing edges in a design increases habitat, which increases the biodiversity and cycling of nutrients. It increases water catchment, accelerates the accumulation of organic matter, and generates higher yields. By increasing the stress or pressure, we can increase yields. Trees thicken their trunks in response to wind. The larger the wind break, the more windborne nutrients, organic matter, seeds, and insects are deposited. The more biodiversity is cycling through an area, the more organic matter accumulates and is cycled into humus. We can physically increase the amount of edge in a system for higher yields as well. An undulating pattern increases edge interaction in a limited space where straight lines, being the shortest distance between two points, limit the edge effect. Human civilization often occupied these edge zones in nature, floodplains, river deltas, and coastal regions. Even as we increase yields, we are also boosting biodiversity by attracting new species through an increase in habitats using edges. We can further encourage such diversity by allowing for variance in the physical environment. Everything from the size of the holes of our fencing to the density of the trees or the types of trees we plant. We can build habitat diversity into our design interventions at every level using edges. From the shaping of the terrain with curved lines for smooth airflow to creating deliberately jagged angles for greater disturbance, more shelter, and more significant airlift. These kinds of changes can lead to unanticipated yields that take time to observe, especially if they bring unique or rare kinds of yields. Edge cropping. We can use the edge effect to generate a yield rather easily. Through alternating large rows or lanes of a field growing annual crops and perennials or tree crops, we create a constant edge effect between the annual beds that are disturbed regularly and often closer to the ground and the perennial beds which are not disturbed and grow tall and form a windbreak and create shade. This system can be created on contour in a key line pattern or it can be used to create even more edge by making the lines wavy. There is actually more room in a field of wavy rows than in straight rows. By researching our plants and carefully matching them up with beneficial plants, we can prevent allopathic plants from harming other plants. The jugalone of a black walnut tree doesn't bother a mulberry tree, though that is not the case for a peach tree. Luckily, a mulberry tree can grow between them and prevent the allopathy from reaching the peach tree through the rhizosphere. Beyond just providing a buffer, we can maximize synergy by pairing up plants that increase each other's yields and benefit the soil. Using legumes that fix atmospheric nitrogen in the soil, we can passively feed our fruit trees the organic matter and nitrogen they need to produce a regular and robust yield. Alley cropping. A system that grows crops between rows of trees is a form of edge cropping, usually done on contour or in a key line design. It is also known as agroforestry. It is fast becoming a recognized and proven way to retain soils, creating shade and mulch with plants on site. Silva pasture is similar in that it alternates trees and pasture strips, using grazers and browsers to simultaneously prune the trees on the edge as they graze down the pasture strips. In both systems, trees can create too much shade over time, making it hard for annuals to grow or pasture to get enough light. This makes these areas perfect for growing mushrooms. Peter McCoy called it fungally cropping in radical mycology. The alternative is to prune to let the light in. Nature strives for balance. The drive for equality is as natural as the temperature between two media seeking equilibrium. In nature, all differences strive for equilibrium. It could be the difference in salinity, temperature, moisture, or anything. When elements with such differences meet, equalizing begins. This principle of balance is key to design and planting guilds. Knowing this and managing it are two different things. Every change we make will affect everything else in a system to varying degrees over time. Every change creates greater complexity. If we have fertility in the soil, adequate water available throughout the growing season, and the right seeds, we can set the stage for nature to determine the balance in an area. Our role after that is to observe how nature is trying to balance the ecosystem and support those elements or cycles. Spirals in nature. We can observe spirals nearly everywhere, from the spinning turbulence caused by large rocks in a river to the spirals of air caused by windbreaks that carry leaf litter into the sky and assist in forming rain. Spirals are found in galaxies, whirlpools, and sap flows. Often these spirals look like a perfect Fibonacci sequence, but even these are imperfect copies of a general spiral pattern, or an adaptation thereof. We can use this predictable form to aerate, mix, maximize minimal space, Focus accumulation and increase biological interaction. Applying patterns. 
Throughout time, humans have used patterns in various ways to interact with each other and the natural world. We've crafted art, images, songs, and dances to house critical information about medicine, weather, history, humanity, nature, and more. Where we don't readily see patterns, we create them to create meaning and understanding. For instance, we navigated the stars using constellations we invented to make the vast array readable. We also use the currents, the winds, water temperature, and more to understand the great patterning at work in the oceans and weather. Not only does pattern recognition underpin maritime navigation, but it is also the foundation for all disciplines. Pattern literacy education is necessary for our more modernized cultures to renew their understanding of patterns. All pre-modern cultures use patterns to maintain cultural knowledge. It is imperative to we craft new songs, dances, and other forms of art that will store our understanding of our world's patterns, pass them down to the next generation in an enjoyable, memorable way. Lastly, in our system, when we apply patterns, we must make sure we apply them to support and enhance the ecology. Even though spirals and matrices are beautiful to look at, we must always make sure they have an environmental benefit. Often when enough observation and reflection is made, patterns that are already present emerge. In this case, we as designers are aligning our designs to the natural patterns already at work on that site.